I'm Robin Arnott. I am a uh, virtual reality developer, and I work in the space that is the collision between virtual reality and game design, on the one hand, and meditation on the other. And I've been working for about six years on a project called SoundSelf that does, with your mind, using interactivity and sounds and flashing lights and all of that jazz that we can do in VR, what meditation does with your mind using a sitting practice. So I want to get a sense who here plays video games. And it counts if you are playing on your iPhone while you're pooping. Hands up. <laughs> Thank you. I see more hands. That's what I want to see. <laughs> All right. Who here has a meditation practice of some sort? Keep your right hand up if you play video games. Left hand for meditation. Cool. Yeah, awesome. I like seeing people who do both. That's cool. So I'm going to be doing later on in this talk, and there's going to be a little bit of an interactive sequence. Uh, you'll have more fun if you join in. Just trust. And uh, let's get going. So there's a saying that I really like, and it goes like this. To a person holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And what I love about this saying is it speaks super simply and elegantly to a truth that every craftsperson must learn, and that is that our tools, as powerful as they are for giving us ways to solve problems and change the world, do so at a cost. And that cost is they color how we see. Now, this cost is, is partly a cost, but it's also a gift. Our way of seeing is partly the gift of our craft. Our, I'm, I'm here to talk about a very specific kind of tool, and that is our disciplines. Our disciplines which connect each of us, each of our hero's journey from naivete through the mastery of our craft to a lineage of people who have been marching the same journey again and again and again and again and again for decades or centuries or millennia or tens of millennia or even longer. With regards to lineages, there's another saying that I really like. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Now this uh, thread of words has an interesting history. It was originally spoken by Isaac Newton, not known for his humility to Robert Hooke as an insult not known for his height. I stand on the shoulders of giants. And yet it has survived to this day as a statement that all but epitomizes humility, humility in our craft, looking back to the ancestors in our lineage and for what they have taught us. When I hear this saying, I imagine myself literally standing on the shoulders of a giant, looking out at a landscape, a vast landscape in front of me with trees and valleys and so on, and I can see Perhaps you can see them as well, spotted through these landscapes, other giants. And some of them are far away, so far away, I can barely make them out from the landscape. Maybe I don't even know they're there. And some of them, and I can see some of you in this room, are close enough that we can sing to each other, educate each other, share the gift of our way of seeing to one another and help each other solve problems. My lineage is a short lineage, it's, it's game design. My ancestors are the uh, creators of Pong. And my journey into this lineage is, is a, a quite personal one. I, um, when I was 10, 10 years old, my mom died. And it was a, I mean, we should have seen it coming and we did see it coming, but I didn't have the tools, I wasn't given the tools to grieve uh, to suffer even. And when I remember this period in my life immediately following her death, I actually don't remember suffering. I remember playing a lot of video games. And the video game that I played a lot of, perhaps the most, was the Civilization series of games. This is a series in which you play the leader of a clan as that clan grows into a nation and then an empire. And playing this game in hindsight, I can see now that playing this game again and again and again and again gave me a way to feel powerful at a time when I didn't feel powerful and gave me a way to, to feel a sense of meaning in my life when I, when I didn't have it. <sighs> and um, in hindsight, I wish I hadn't had this tool because it, it just gave me a way to, to numb something I needed to feel and it's taken me 20 years to really feel. And this is tragically the dark side of my lineage. This tool, game design, and it is a tremendously powerful tool. Do not doubt the power of this tool. It is a testament to the power of this tool, the way people look at the screen when they are fully invested in an experience. How completely game design 
shapes a person's, con person's consciousness. I don't know any other tool that does this as completely, as quickly as a video game can do. So in spite of this dark side, because we are using this powerful tool to solve the wrong kinds of problems. We can't use video games, at least not the way we've been using them, to solve problems of loneliness, powerlessness, meaninglessness. It just doesn't work. But there are other things we can use this powerful tool to do. I've really fallen in love with this craft, with the power of this craft. And w the way I see it, game design is like a scaffolding. Now, when a building comes up in a, in a city, the first thing to come up is the scaffolding. And the scaffolding is this temporary structure that defines where the building will be, what it will be. The scaffolding actually causes the building. Game design is like this. A game design, when you rest your attention on the rules, the mechanics, now rules, mechanics, if I'm holding the hammer of game design, the thing I see everywhere, the nail I see everywhere, is the place where rules meet attention. So when you rest your attention, on a set of rules or mechanics, your consciousness shifts and you change and what you are when you are playing a game changes. And when it's done well, a good game will help you change into something that is deeper than your normal narrative of yourself, that is, is deeper than your, your personal experience, that is actually touches into something more universal, more archetypal. Think about it and maybe you've experienced this. When I play a video game, I am a warrior. Or, as when I was playing Civilization, I am a ruler. And modern games are exploring subtler archetypes, just as important. I am a listener. I am an explorer. I am a storyteller. This is my lineage, my narrative, my story. It is from this place of uh, first playing a lot of video games and then learning to create them that I found myself in Austin, Texas, where I now live, uh, in a hippie community there. And I want you to imagine me, this person, uh, sort of disembodied, right? I spent a lot of my life playing video games and making video games, using a computer. And there's this way I, I kind of, and also, you know, avoiding the pain of the loss of my mother, geez, like, there's so much work I was doing to stay out of my body. And I found this community of people and fire spinners and so on, deeply embodied people. And I began practicing with them. And there's this one practice that I love and still love, and it's, it's called a, a group ohm. And it works like this. You, you sit in a group of people, 10 people, 100 people, more. And everybody shares their tone into the space. Mm -hmm. And all of our voices come together, I can remember it. All of our voices come together to coalesce into something that is alive and of me, but not, not defined by me, something that I am a part of. And through feeling my voice and feeling my body, through that embodied connection to everybody else around me, I can feel a sense of connection to something bigger than myself. It is with this recent embodiment and holding the hammer of game design in my hand that I found myself in the desert in a dome. And the dome was full of music and I closed my eyes and began to tone just to feel my body and to feel the earth through my body. And something magical happened in that moment, a synchronicity. The moment I began toning, the music filled with voices that harmonized perfectly within my, with my own voice. And in that moment, something switched for me that has never switched back. With my eyes closed, I heard these voices as my own voice. And that was just the first of many dominoes to fall in that minute or so. I opened my eyes and looked around me and saw the people around me as I can see you and the space around me and the light in the space. And I felt a sense of I-ness, of me-ness in the other people and in the space itself that was normally reserved for this body, this voice, this person. And then I closed my eyes again and my eyes rolled back into my head and I could feel that everything that is 
or was or will be or can be is what I am and that this person is an expression of that deep, vast reality. An expression. This is called a oneness experience or a mystical experience or a spiritual experience or a religious experience. It goes by many names. Experiences like these are outrageously common. Who has had an experience like this or thinks they have? See a handful. It counts if you had it while you were dreaming. It counts if you had it on a drug. <laughs> to those of us who are brave enough to recognize this experience as showing us something true about ourselves and not just a trick of the mind, we can't help but be permanently changed by it. I became really interested in meditation at that point. Not just the practice of meditation, but also uh, with my game design tool in hand, how, do th how does meditation work in the history of meditation? Where does it come from? Introspective practices, I, I call it a lineage of introspection, uh, as far as I can tell, um, goes back further than written history, seems to be deeply woven into our humanity, that we look inward and ask, who am I? Every culture has its expression of this lineage, and every culture in its expression of this lineage leaves a thumbprint on that lineage that survives as that path of introspection grows into time, from the past into modernity into the future. I think a great example of this is Zen Buddhism, very, very well known. Zen Buddhism started in China, moved to Japan where it picked up unmistakably Japanese flavors. And now Zen Buddhism has moved from Japan, you can barely find it in Japan, to the, the United States mostly, where currently it is picking up flavors of psychology and personal growth. This is the evolution of this lineage. Next to this grand lineage of wizened people with a, uh, a faithful relationship to their story and their past, my own lineage of game design sure seems humble at, at best and uh, at worst maybe superficial. But then I had this flash of insight not long after my oneness experience, and I realized that this giant that had once seemed so far into the distance was actually far closer than I had imagined. Because each of these practices, be them sitting meditation, mandalas, paying attention to a guru, all of them are a game. All of them are a set of rules that you rest your attention on, and when you rest your attention upon it, you change. But the way you change is different from a video being because the you, the who I am that you embody yourself as being, that you begin to witness yourself as, doesn't stop here and doesn't stop here. But that inquiry, who am I, becomes, is, is like an umbilical cord that connects you to everything. I found in my memory the memory of my first oneness experience, a blueprint for how I could use my tool, game design, to create for other people the kind of experience that I had in that dome in the desert with the music. A few weeks after that, as soon as I started working on it, a few weeks after I started working on it, the Oculus Rift Kickstarter launched. You can call that a coincidence, I call it a synchronicity. As I stand on this stage to share what I've learned, we act out a ritual played turn by turn. I give you my voice and you give me your ears and I share what I've learned this last six or so years, but before I can even begin to convey these ideas, there's a more subtle game that we play. I say, this part is you and this part is me. And if all's well and good, you say, yes, I agree. There's nothing more useful than duality, but I can't take us further with a you and a me. Please stand up. This part's not what you're used to, sure, I admit, but if you can be brave, it will be worth it. I want you to notice the space that we share. So when I go like this, take a deep breath of air. This time, let the whole breath out with a sound. Oh. 
take a short break after this round. Gurus and mantras and incense and songs and fastings and ecstatic speakings in tongues and sitting in silence for week after week. This isn't the language that my people speak. We can't learn what they've learned from a voice we can't hear. We can't see what they've seen if it doesn't appear as a notification on all of our phones or a theme well explored on this week's Game of Thrones. If our game is down here, then our way will be cut in the strike of a hammer or the press of a button. Westerner, you can sit down now if you'd like. I'm a Westerner, and more specifically, I'm an American. And there's a lot I love that is easy to love about being an American and being a Westerner. And there's also a lot that's difficult to love, challenging to love, hard to love. But it is worth the effort of loving it because that is my heritage. And the longer away I push, the longer I push that away, the more I deny myself from, from an important part of who I am. And the longer I, the longer we do that for, the longer we call part of our culture or our whole culture unsacred, the longer we deny the unique thumbprint of our lineages, our culture, from a lineage whose history goes back forever and that will outlive us. Our tools are the tools of transcendence. It's just a question of how we use them. Thank you. <laughs> 